This is off planet radio. Hey everybody, welcome back to Off Planet Radio, Off Planet TV. I'm Randy Moggins, Emily Moyer is with me. And uh, wow, we've got, a, we've got what I consider to be one of the premier shows today. Again, dipping our toe back into the legacy of what the show's really about, which is going deep into the aspects of uh, UFOs, alien abduction, military abductions, black military operations, We've got a chocolate cake with a whole bunch of icing on it. And here with us is James Bartley. James defines himself as an abductee exposed to high levels of spiritual warfare. He studied in England and Germany, and he was a student of military history with an emphasis on intelligence, counterintelligence, and special operations. He's worked in the semiconductor industry, the telecom industry, and in county government as an um, um, ombudsman, I can say that, ombudsman. He's also worked for civil service at major military command in intelligence-related capacity, and he has a website of which he is the switchmaster at cosmicswitchboard.com. He is a well-regarded, authoritative speaker on all of the subjects we're going to talk about today. James Bartley, welcome to Off Planet Radio, my friend. Thank you, my friend. Thank you for having me on, Randy. Thank, thank you for having me on, Emily. I'm really looking forward to this. Yeah, Us you, too, absolutely. We, we kind of have gathered together at different times. This is our first time together, uh, the three of us. But um, I've been on your show, Emily's been on your show, and we've been wanting to get you on for uh, quite a while now to discuss a lot of some serious topics that are going on. I'm going to open this up because I want people to stay current. Um, you just put out a video that basically goes into some aspects of the UFO field, mainly some leading figures, no names mentioned here today. You guys can go back and figure out who we're talking about. But this whole capacity for injecting the ego into the conversation and what that is masking in terms of disinformation it was a it was a fascinating video that that really, frankly, takes the piss out of out of the whole front end stratosphere of ufology right now. Thank you. I felt it was timely. It, it was a subject uh, ego activation amongst abductees, amongst contactees, and amongst speakers. That my colleagues and I, Eve Lorgan, for one, we talked about this many years ago. Barbara Barthelick and I all always talked about it, but somehow along the line, it, it got lost in the shuffle. And then because of the, the internet and uh, blog, radio, podcast, what have you, suddenly there emerged all these personalities seemingly overnight. And when many of them with their egos activated. So the reason why I made that commentary was to point out that ego activation is a red flag in many cases for outright entity attachment, entity infestation, uh, someone being a literal host for some negative entity. And I also talked about the, the non-meat filler aspect of a lot of these people where they can talk and talk and talk and, and make really simple concepts sound incredibly obtuse, uh, incredibly uh, difficult to comprehend. They, they try to mystify things instead of simplifying things. And whenever you see grandiosity, uh, endless posturing, uh, out, of, out of whack ego, I really encourage the listeners and the viewers to kind of tune into the vibe because we have to, we have to tune into the substance, not so much the style. A lot of these people that are behaving in this fashion, they know that many listeners uh, have what I call a follower gene, that because of whatever unresolved issues they have within them, some person comes along, you know, using all the right cliches, using all the right buzzwords and acting in a very authoritative manner. 
that's enough to hook in a lot of people. And unfortunately, some of these people that are looking for answers are going through their own challenges. And so their needs are not being met and they're being led down a, a very unpleasant path that may take them years to recover from. Well, and the other side of this is, James, as you well know, many of the people coming into this arena are people that themselves suspect or have confirmed that they are subjects of various programs, black ops programs, my labs, uh, abductions, and they are already traumatized. Many of them are deeply programmed, and many of them, as you point out, have this follower aspect to them that wants a comfortable scenario presented to them to kind of wrap around all the fear and trauma that they've gone into. I don't know how much you are involved anymore with the UFO movement in terms of conferences and things like that, but it looks to me like the whole conference circuit has now been inundated with, with speakers and presenters that largely represent the stratum of what I'll call faux spirituality and shock jock kind of narratives, um, the secret space program, all of these, all of these, this cosmic blather that's going on that never touches the surface on the reality of what we're going to talk about today. But what's your sense right now? Has the UFO community, as I've asserted, been completely compromised by intelligence operatives coming in? Absolutely, it has. I feel that a, a major problem is what you just pointed out, that there are so many patently unhealed, fragmented, uh, frankly, mind-controlled people that have emerged as leaders in this field. And what intelligence does, Randy and Emily, as you know, is they psych profile these people, and then they feed these faux whistleblowers, faux uh, you know, recovered mind control survivors in their direction, and without any proper vetting or anything, they get these people on their shows, and these people develop their own following, and it becomes an echo chamber where it's almost like they're trying to create this phony narrative where they each repeat the same drivel, the same uh, half-truths, the same distortions. And because it seems like a multitude of them are now saying these things, right, the secret space program, et cetera, et cetera, suddenly it, it has this aura of validity. Well, if all these people are talking about it, and another thing that's gone on too, Randy and Emily, is it seems to me that either they're sending trolls and shills out to make these comments online, or they've actually gone to, to the trouble to, to mind control and, and pre-traumatize, if you will, certain individuals. So when they become exposed to all this so-called secret space program info, they have a very bad ab reaction to it, right? And so they tell themselves, well, you know, I, I watched this video and, and I read the comments of so, such and such person, and I had this panic attack. So ergo, it must mean there's something to it. It must mean that I'm part of this program, you see? And, and what they've done, as you pointed out, Randy, is they've glamorized it all. Instead of stripping it to its bare essentials, this is mind control. This is subjecting people to horrific trauma in complete viola violation of their sovereign rights as, as, as yeah. being. Yeah. What they've done is, well, they've glamorized it, okay. And what happens is a lot of these unhealed people that are looking for answers, they say to myself, themselves, no, I'm not a victim. I, I'm part of Solar Warden. I'm, I'm here to defend the solar system against en enemy alien attack. So it neutralizes all these people who are trying to heal themselves. And quite frankly, some of them, sometime down the track, may prove a threat to this matrix control system. But they've been neutralized at the front end because they've been pulled into this clown show of you know, personalities, egos, and empires. Yeah, it really is a clown show. I mean, I can't think of a better term to describe it than I have sat back over the last few years and watched as a lot of this has played out with my jaw up and just going, what are you talking about? I mean, this has become comic book, uh, CGI, uber Hollywood overproduced blather that just streams out endlessly. It has no connectivity 
even to itself in a lot of cases, the narratives are very disjointed. They're, they're hyperbole, they're, they're basically there to entertain. And that would be fine if we were talking about Marvel Comics, but we're not talking about Marvel. In fact, you will get more disclosure from a Marvel comic these day than, days than you will from most UFO conventions, in my opinion. Yes, the UFO convention circuit is history. I mean, I remember when I first started going to conferences in the early 90s, there were people that were pushing the envelope, people like Bill Hamilton, people like Jorge Martin, uh, talking about underground bases, the, the ongoing interaction between non-human life forms and military aerospace medical people and my labs. And then now it's just been taken to a level of absurdity. And I believe that's the goal that, that intelligence has to reduce the subject to a level of absurdity. So they can always point to these people that are part of this clown show and say, this is what UFO research is all about. Forget about all this other stuff that's gone on because yeah. that's all gone into the memory hole. Let's just focus on uh, the ridiculous aspects of it. And, and so that will in itself will tr turn people off uh, in the mainstream from looking into this. Uh, Freeman pointed out that one of these individuals wound up on the Stephen Colbert show. I mean, how many people yeah. do we know would wind up on such a show to talk at length. And I, I haven't watched it, but I guarantee you what this individual did not talk about is, yes, I've been subjected to horrendous mind control. I've been traumatized. I've seen children used in the most obscene, vile ways. No, they're not going to talk about that. They're going to glamorize it and make it all sexy and trendy. So that's the problem that we have. And, and what I try to do is bring it back to the, to the most basic level that these are people these my labs and other assorted project people, to use a generic general term, they have been used against their will. Many in many cases, they were born into these uh, uh, programs without their knowledge. And uh, these are people that are simply trying to heal, reintegrate. They don't want popularity. They don't want fame. They just want to get on with their lives, right? They want more understanding, to be sure. Yeah. But, you know, they have no interest in being a celebrity. So that kind of introduces a whole realm of topics that we're going to go more deeply into uh for the listeners out there this is the first hour that you're seeing if you're seeing this on youtube and other public platforms including the off-planet radio site the second hour is available to our subscribers and patrons over at patreon.com so uh don't forget about that because we're going to go a little bit deeper as we go through this today but james uh, i realized a few months ago especially when I began listening to specifically your material, that I really didn't have a good working knowledge of what my labs is. The term has been around in my thinking for probably, at least in the popular realm of the internet subculture for about maybe 10 to 15 years in some fashion. But I don't think it's been well defined. I don't think people understand it inside the context of projects like MK Ultra, Monarch, Often, all of these other other three-letter agency programs that have been running since the 1940s and frankly even earlier than that. So can we get like an historical sweep and an overview of what my labs is and how we can plug into the subject knowledgeably? The term my labs was popularized by Helmut Lammer, I, if memory serves, he was an Austrian guy, and he wrote a thin book called My Labs, and I forget what the, sub, the subtitle was, but uh, his thesis was that these people that were in these mind control programs and were seeing aliens, the only reason they were seeing aliens is because they were under some kind of CIA narco-hypnosis mind control, which, uh, which I don't agree with. Uh, to me, I would, I would describe a My Lab as someone who was first and foremost a legitimate alien abductee slash contactee. They have had an ongoing experience with probably more than one ET race, very often the reptilians, but not always. And as we know, the alien abduction phenomena is multi-generational. There's something about the DNA profile, the morphic resonance field of people in our given family, which uh, draws the interest of a number of different non-human life forms and increasingly over time, uh, black ops intelligence. 
So that's the fundamental template. These people were legitimately, are legitimate alien abductees to begin with. And then you have this MyLab overlay. Now, I should point out that there has been this persistent meme over time saying that, oh, there are no aliens. It's all just military. But I would remind people that long before we've heard terms like Project Bluebeam or, or holograms, et cetera, we go back to antiquity. And there have always been yeah. throughout the lore of all the civilizations and cultures and indigenous tribes around the world always has there been this uh, ongoing connection with non-human life forms, whether they lived below the earth, whether they lived off planet, whether they were interdimensional or all three. So that's the basic concept that I have, uh, that my labs are first and foremost alien abductees. Secondly, because of the nature of their DNA profile, there is, I believe, latent metaphysical powers, for lack of a better term, within the DNA profile of some of these people. Some of these people are naturally psychic. They're natural remote viewers, natural astral travelers. And it must be understood that when people have interactions with non-human life forms, sometimes these aliens, okay, they can bring out, they can engender, amplify latent psychic abilities within people. So in alien context, the, these abductees can be on board an alien ship. They can interface with alien technology. They can read alien script. They can operate alien control systems and even fly alien craft. And the black ops military aerospace knows this. So that's going on too. There's that dynamic. And there's two interweaving parallel aspects to this as well. We've got the hybridized, mostly reptilian human bloodlines in the form of these secret societies, fraternal orders that have run things all along, at least since the the last celestially driven cataclysm on this planet. So you have these secret brotherhoods, priesthoods that utilize for lack of a better term, magic. They've interacted with off world beings, subterranean beings all along. They're not the only ones, native Americans, the Lakota talk about their interactions with beings from Sirius. Uh, the original people in Australia talk about their interactions with Palladians. So, that's been going on all along. But for our purposes here, this, and it's been described as the, ser the Brotherhood of the Serpent, the, the Dragon Court, the Court of the Dragon. I encourage the listeners to, to check out William Bramley's classic book, Gods of Eden, because he, he goes into all this stuff. Absolutely. So that's the template. And then as time went on, so there'd always been this interaction with non-human life forms by this priesthood. But as time went on and we go into the modern era, we began having crash retrievals. We, the, the military began recovering alien craft. So what happened was this already existing serpent brotherhood, they became the main players in what became this crash program to back engineer and develop and weaponize this alien technology. And over time, since they've already had contacts with certain subterranean and ET races, off-world ET races, Inevitably, there were survivors in some of these crashed saucers and, and, and other types of craft. And, you know, debriefing these, these aliens, they would find out the cosmology from the alien perspective, uh, who their enemies were, what the nature of their society is like, uh, what is there a division of labor, is there a hierarchy? I mean, they would have all these think tanks of sociologists and, and whatnot to come up with these questions that the intelligence people would ask of these aliens that survived. And over time, you know, these alliances were formed, right? So that's where we're at today. And the, the MyLabs factor into this because, again, they can interface with alien technology, some of them. They can be sent off world. They can be sent through wormholes. And the experience won't kill them because it's within their morphic resonance blueprint, within their DNA profile, that they can do these things. And another quick point about MyLabs is, we began hearing about my lab cases. We didn't even call them my labs in the old days. We called them military type cases because we didn't know what else to call them. Uh, like I said, Herm Helmut Lammer came up with that term later. But I would say the late 80s, early 90s, we began hearing stories about legitimate alien abductees who were being kidnapped, quite frankly, kidnapped 
by the black elements of the military, the Army, Navy, and the Air Force, uh, taken either to uh, a military base uh, on the surface or oftentimes underground, or it varied, they would be taken to a corporate front office in some building in town somewhere, it varied. And the, the different ways they kidnapped them would be take them in a van, take them in a vehicle, take them in a helicopter. And as time went on, they began just teleporting the people out of their homes. So, you know, that's pretty much where we're at today. And there is an off-world capability. As Ben Rich pointed out, the deep black elements of the military aerospace community have been traveling through the stars. So that, that part is true. And as my listeners on my show, The Cosmic Switchboard, will hear, one of my interviews coming out will be with Jim Goodall who is the expert on all things stealth, all things SR-71, all things Area 51. And his sources told him in the late 80s, early 90s, that not only was there an ongoing interaction with non-human life forms and elements of the military aerospace community, but that there, had, there was probably in all likelihood a base on Mars. Bill Hamilton's sources years ago talked about, and he developed sources in the Antelope Valley, in the aerospace field, uh, Lockheed, uh, all those corporations in the Antelope Valley, in the high desert of Southern California, his sources likewise said that there was a base on Mars. And the sources I've developed over the years and the my labs I've spoken to, n hardly any of them have gone public. They've talked about being taken to Mars. So long before the Circus Sideshow Act manifested, there had already been this understanding amongst people who take the subject seriously that th there is off-world capability and they have gone to Mars and established a base. So. so can we assume that what we know or think we know about the front-facing NASA programs regarding space exploration, specifically since 1960 forward beginning with Gemini and then ramping up into Apollo, the moon landing and everything that came after, was a mask for what was really going on in the background and had been going on. And how long do you think the, the space, program, yeah, space program formally was going on inside the United States prior to those missions? You mean as far as the real off-world capability yeah. was concerned? Yeah, at least I would say since the 1980s, at least. Okay. And there have been reports over time of the test flying of recovered alien craft and also alien craft obtained as a result of this alliance, if you will, between one or more ET races. The Zeta Reticulines come up again and again in, in the research and in the lore. And, and one quick point, uh, my mentor, Barbara Bartholick, had a MyLab case that went back all the way to the 1950s. There was this family, um, multiple generations, grandchildren, parents, grand, grandparents, that were kept in detainment on their own uh, remote farmhouse in Indiana because the aliens had come, landed on their property and had interacted with them, mind controlled them, et cetera. And so no sooner had the aliens left than like three truckloads of, of, of army personnel showed up along with the inevitable psychologists and, and, and the, um, the hazmat people who were digging up soil samples and going around taking like readings of the property. So as far back as the 1950s, people were being uh, detained by the military that had uh, been exposed to aliens. And, and Leonard Stringfield talks about, the late great Leonard Stringfield talks about similar cases that he learned about where back in the day in the 60s and 70s, when people had had encounters with ETs, they were detained by the military. So that had been going on all along. Now back to your question. I feel that NASA has been a front, a cover all along. I believe there are elements within NASA that are deeply involved in the alien technology, the, the back engineering of, of alien technology, et cetera, but they are not the, the, the real players. And people should always remember that that NASA is an element of the Department of Defense. So they are not a civilian organization. It's, that's why they're astronauts or almost all Navy or Air Force pilots. They all come under the military uh, code of justice. 
so NASA was always a, a front. However, that much being said, some of their astronauts have had UFO sightings. Uh, Gordon uh, Cooper, he had UFO experience as a fighter pilot in Germany, the 1950s. Uh, General James McDivitt, I think he was on a Gemini flight. He reported seeing a UFO. I was watching a space shuttle uh, mission. This was like in Sacramento in the, the mid-1990s when they still had the NASA channel. I don't know if they still have it. But I was sitting there, and <laughs> there was the Earth. And then you hear these two shuttle astronauts talking. And I was kind of in another state. I was just, I don't know, I was just daydreaming or something. And I was just looking at the planet Earth. Next thing you know, two very large saucers fly by from left to right, right across the face of the Earth. And the astronauts abruptly stop talking. We have, we have interference. We can't hear you, James. Okay. Well, I was just relating a tale back in the 1990s when I was in, in Sacramento. And I was watching the NASA channel. My friend just had it on, right? And I saw two large saucers fly by right in front of the, the, the cameras right across the earth from left to right. And I was blinking my eyes. I thought I hallucinated the whole thing, right? The two astronauts just abruptly stopped talking. I think that it was because of that and similar episodes that they decided to create this big time gap between the real feed and what the people on, on TV see. So... I do believe that NASA is a front. I don't believe that they got to the moon. They certainly not in the way they've told us, right? I, I believe they got to the moon. I just don't think they got there in those flimsy tin cans and this notion that they were able to cram the, the, the lunar dune buggy into the lunar lander is patently absurd. I mean, how would they, that thing even fit? How would they deploy it? How would they, it doesn't make sense, none of it does. But I do believe they've gotten to the moon. I do believe they've gotten to Mars. They just didn't get there in the way they're, they're telling us. They, they would have us believe in the old paradigm of rockets and, and whatnot when the concepts of anti-gravity, field propulsion, electrogravitics was well understood going back to the 40s and 50s. Dr. T. Townsend Brown, John Searle, there was a number of pioneers in this field. And that was that whole pros concept was accelerated with the recovery of all this alien technology. Which kind of leads us into this situation where we go, was Werner von Braun brought in as kind of another front man? I mean, given that his, his background, his specialty as, as a Nazi scientist was in rocketry, um, where, do you, where do you land on that? I mean, it looks to me like the history of NASA was kind of contrived from the beginning as a, as, as a cover operation for things that already existed, which kind of takes us to the point that, yes, yes, boys and girls, there probably really was, this is a secret space program, just not what's being described to you by the, uh, the uh, chatterers on uh, Gaia TV. I agree. And, you know, we must give credit where credit's due. Uh, people like Richard Hoagland had, has gone to great lengths to talk about how these space anomalies, these, these rather large monuments and artificial structures on, on Mars had been imaged, but NASA, Jet Propulsion Laboratory, et cetera, have gone out of their way to kind of debunk all that, even though it was their imagery that captured uh, these huge artificial structures, pyramids, uh, the face on Mars, et cetera, to begin with. And the, the face on Mars is a classic example. That's a huge artificial uh, structure and it's millions of years old. Uh, and, you know, what kind of civilization could have created such a thing? That's, that's what people have to ask themselves. So there's an element of NASA that has played a role in, in covering this up. And we've heard the accounts of former NASA people talking about how uh, the imagery of, uh, of unusual objects on Moon and the Mars and Mars have been uh, smudged out, let's say. But getting back to Werner von Braun, he certainly knew. He certainly knew that, in fact, some of his comments uh, in interviews he's given the German magazines uh, definitely suggest he knew a lot about the aliens and, and UFOs and alien technology. His mentor was Hermann Oberth, who was quoted as saying, and I'm paraphrasing, I can't remember the exact quote, he said that 
the reason UFOs don't make sonic booms and are able to make instantaneous right angle turns, instantaneous abrupt changes of direction at high speed is because they generate their own artificial gravity field. So every atom, every molecule within the craft, including the occupants of the craft, move in unison to the craft, right? So there's no G-forces, there's no, none of that. And Herman Oberth was taken on by the U.S. Army's Missile Development Center at Huntsville, Alabama, and he was involved with Redstone Arsenal, et cetera. So he was the mentor of, of Werner von Braun, the one who made Werner von Braun who he is. So, and there's been reports, if one remembers the uh, one of the true smoking guns of UFO history, the letter written by Dr. Robert Sarbarker. At the time, he was the dean of the Washington Institute of Technology. In the 1950s, he was a Pentagon consultant, and he had his own missile development company. Uh, when he was in the Pentagon, he had access to files about recovered alien craft, recovered alien technology, and some of the beings piloting these craft. And, you know, like, likewise, he said that, you know, Werner von Braun may have been part of the project. He said for sure Dr. John von Neumann was involved. For sure, uh, uh, what's his name, um, Vannevar Bush was involved. But he also felt Oppenheimer at some level was involved, and they probably would have consulted Werner von Braun because a lot of those paperclip scientists and engineers were there at Fort Bliss, uh, Texas. They were there at White Sands, New Mexico. And that was just a short hop and a skip to Roswell and Kirtland Air Force Base and places where a lot of this activity was taking place. So I do believe Werner Braun, von Braun knew a lot more about the subject of aliens and UFOs, but his, his brief, his job was to keep everything at a rocket level, keep everything at this NASA mission control level uh, as the focal point uh, for the public. So in terms of breaking this out a little bit further, um, we come back again to my labs, which historically is a more recent bookmark in the in the case history. Um, at what point do we see military intelligence and intelligence operatives entering the picture from the standpoint of using my labs and UFO type scenarios in programming for mind control subjects. Do you have a sense of that in terms of the scale and the timeline? Yes, I would say that it really accelerated in the, in the late 80s and the early 90s, although I, I've known my labs, Diane Johnson was one. Uh, far back in the 60s, she was being compelled by her military handlers to do remote viewing for them. She'd had a number of experiences with the greys, with reptilians and other beings. But it really accelerated, I would say, in the, in the 80s and 90s, because more and more people in Southern California, there was Leisha Davidson. She was reporting uh, military abductions. There was Leah Haley, who's since been subjected to a lot of mind control, a lot of manipulation. She's basically recanted, right? And then we had people like the late, great Dr. Carla Turner, who was in my lab herself. Not many people know this, but Barbara Bartholick herself had military type experiences, but we kept all that under, you know, under the rug for the most part. She was having like electromagnetic radiation beamed at her house and all this dreadful stuff was going on. So in the eighties and the nineties, it really started accelerating and people were reporting being kidnapped by elements of the military, routinely drugged uh, injections in the arm, injections in the neck, we were hearing stories not only from civilians, but we were hearing stories from ex-military people. And it seems to me, uh, Randy and Emily, that the powers that be, they've long since figured out a way to determine, I don't know, it could be through a simple blood test, DNA profile, morphic field resonance, something, some kind of identifier uh, that signifies that a given person has had ET experiences. And also we must remember one of the important cases of all time, which, you know, this person really hasn't been properly debriefed and interviewed in my view, Dan Sherman. He talked about in the early 1970s, he was part of a program as an intuitive communicator for the Air Force branch of the NSA. He was being given telepathic information from 
two Zeta grays that he was in contact with, and the information always had to do with, uh, with abductees, for lack of a better term, and the location they were abducted and returned to. So as far back as the early 1970s, this dovetails with stories about alliances, about agreements allowing certain ET groups to kidnap, you know, momentarily, uh, temporarily abductees, return them in exchange for technology. I think there's something to that. So that had been going on for some time. But as far as utilizing the MyLabs as operational assets, it really kicked in at a high gear in the 80s and 90s because the MyLabs were not only reporting being drugged and debriefed, they were reporting, and I knew a number of these people, I went through it myself, where we were subjected to all kinds of psychological as well as physical training, uh, training in and out of our physical bodies, not just where we're being put through our paces physically, but we were being taken out of our bodies astrally and put in these virtual environments and being put through our paces again and again and again to familiarize ourselves with, with certain locations, for lack of a better term. And some of this training was in groups. I used to be trained in, with groups of people that I worked with, that I knew personally. And we would call each other up and we'd say, I saw you in experience last night. What do you remember? And then we'd call another person. This is before the internet. So we'd have this daisy chain of phone calls going around, calling each other up and finding out, you know, what, you know, what each individual remembered. And we'd put together this picture, this mosaic. Of, and we were having experiences multiple times per week for a while. Mm -hmm. So that was going on. And a lot of the training, interestingly enough, uh, Randy and Emily, had to do with surviving certain apocalyptic scenarios, whether it was like a financial collapse, civil unrest, a foreign military invasion, nuclear war, uh, celestial cataclysms, whatever the case may be, there was a variety of different apocalyptic scenarios that we were trained to survive. We would be taught how to forage for food and, and how to delegate responsibility. Okay, you go find clean water, you know, also within the context of a nuclear, biological, chemical environment too. Uh, you go loot the stores, you go, you know, bring back firewood, etc. So, so that was going on. And then as time went on, we began hearing reports of people that were interfacing, that were being made by the military to interact with certain ET groups, sometimes groups of ETs they were not normally interacting with, right? Because there's this cosmic push and pull tug of war between the ETs that a given individual is interacting with and the ETs that the military aerospace is in league with. And so the person would oftentimes find themselves in a cosmic tug of war where, you know, they're usually having con contacts with generally what seem to be benevolent beings, but on the other hand, they were being kidnapped and, and made to work with greys and reptilians and other beings, and they would be trained in combat. They would be trained in hostage rescue. They would be trained in weaponry, both terrestrial and advanced. So that really kicked in a high gear in, in the late 80s and, and the 90s. So Emily, anything that... Right. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm most, I'm, people will probably be surprised and relieved that I'm mostly listening today. Um, uh, which was kind of my plan because, you know, that's so interesting for me listening to you, James. I wasn't super familiar with your work until Randy was on your show and then I was impressed with what you did with him. So I've been going back and listening to some stuff and it is really, really interesting for me. And because um, so many of the experiences you describe sound familiar to my personal experience and also to people that I've spoken to. But for me, the aliens have always been, the alien stuff and the UFO stuff has always been a lot less of a thing. Like I, you know, like I don't, um, I don't know why that is because, you know, I, but it's, you know, it's it hasn't been a thing for me. Like I really, um, it, it's not that I don't, it, it's not even a question of whether or not I believe they exist because I don't think you have to have seen something for it to exist kind of thing. I mean, I've seen ships and stuff like that, but I've never had an experience with an alien, but I've had all of the, all of the other experiences that you talk about, like the way you're describing the experiences, the things that have happened to you and other people, um, that all, I mean, when you're describing your training in and out of your body and all this kind of stuff, I mean, that's, you know, night, that, you know, I'm super familiar with all of that kind of stuff. So it is interesting to me. I have a couple of questions um, winding back to just a little bit. 
And when you were talking about how uh, it's been misdescribed that if, if, what, if we've been to the moon or space for that matter, then how we got there. And if those things have been misdescribed, do you think it's possible that also what space is and where it is has been misdescribed? Yes, I believe so. In what amounted to a deathbed confession when the late Ben Rich was interviewed by Tom Keller, a, a guy with an aerospace background and a MUFON consultant, the uh, Tom Keller asked uh, Ben Rich, you know, how are the craft piloted? How do the craft, inter or how do the occupants interact with the navigation systems and the controls and what have you? And then Ben Rich answered that question with another question. He asked Tom Keller, well, how does ESP work, right? And then Tom Keller said, all time and space is one. And mm -hmm. that, and then yeah. Ben Rich said, exactly, that's how it works. All time and space is one. These craft do not fly, well, yeah. some of them at least, don't yeah. fly uh, interstellar space in a linear fashion. They have a way of shortening the distance. Like in our atmosphere, they, they even manifest uh, the ability to disappear and reappear in certain places. Yeah. They don't just take off at very high speed, which they can do, but they just sometimes demanifest. I've, I've spoken yeah. to people that have observed a very large craft, like a crowd of, of school children. And this guy told me the story um, in the 90s, and he said this happened when he was a boy. Uh, he, he was out at night uh, with a group of students and a teacher, and they watched a very large craft for a long time, close range, relatively low to the ground, and after a while, it just disappeared. It did not depart in a linear yeah. fashion. It just demanifested. So even in our atmosphere, they manifest that some of the craft manifest this ability. So this is where it gets to the See, I think that we took a, lo a wrong turn with a lot of the mainstream science, and I think it was originally designed to, to lead us in the wrong way. I, I think that if we go back to what they used to call ether physics, if we go back to Thank what you. mystics and science yeah. yes. just talked about, as, as the ether, I think we're closer. Yes. To, you, know, you know what I mean? Because we, we, every one of us has had astral experiences knows that location, time, none of that is a factor. Those are just constructs that have been yeah. created by this matrix system to kind of hem us in and kind of limit our ability to perceive and interact with our, our surroundings. Everyone who's had remote viewing experiences, I've had spontaneous remote viewing experiences yeah. Yeah. See instantly to the other side of the world. So there's no distance. And, and a lot of us that, uh, and a lot of friends that are legitimate energy workers they can send energy to you or I instantly. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there is no time, there is no distance, there is no geography in between. So if we get back to that mode of thinking, I think we're yeah. headed in the right direction. And that way things like yeah. space, distance, fuel consumption, and none of that apply anymore because people still think in, in linear terms, oh, well, interstellar space is impossible because the amount of fuel, you know, the... Uh, the, the time dilation effect, the closer you get to the speed of light. The speed of light is not an upper speed limit. That only applies to, to astrophysicists and, and, and people right. like that. It has yeah. nothing to do with, with astral travelers or remote viewers or with these, these beings. And so when we get back to the ability of the civilizations, including our own now, or actually the deep black civilization, they can generate uh, using high potential electricity generate tremendous fields of artificial gravity then you can start to do all kinds of stuff you can start to bend and warp space yeah. for lack of a better term so if we go in that direction i think we're, we're headed in the right direction yeah no i totally agree i think there's a misperception like what you said space and time are kind of one and in some instances don't actually exist at all and i think there's a lot of confusion i think that like a lot of things that people think of as space issues are really time issues. Like I know a lot of times people will be like, Emily, you're awfully weird. Are you an alien? Are you from somewhere else? And I tell them, no, I'm not from another place. I'm from another time. You know what I mean? Like, and I think that, that they have really made a muck of this whole like time space kind of continuum thing. Absolutely intentionally. I always tell people that um, the projects take place outside of time. Like there is no time at all involved in any of that really, you know, that that is something that is a completely a this matrix thing. But also you said something before about um, 
how they identify us, like bloodlines, do they identify us before birth? Is it something with our blood? Is it morphic resonance? And what I understand mostly just intuitively, but you know, from experience as well, is that they have been tracking us throughout incarnations by our frequency. Yes, they do that. By our frequency, and they are they know when we're coming in. They, yeah. they basically understand when one is coming in and and what an appropriate vessel for that frequency is, body wise, family wise, or whatever. And they work very quickly and very busily. You know, not necessarily quickly because they think they maybe know from they, they have a good amount of knowledge before we actually come in. But they go about creating a program that so when we arrive, our program is waiting for us. Right? Absolutely. The program to manipulate, control, deter, you know, whatever, whatever. You know, they want to have. It feels to me like they want to have access, the advantage of access to the, those latent abilities you're talking about, but somehow keep us in the dark about the fact that they exist. And so, at, not, at nighttime when we're supposed to be sleeping, right? They're like we're, you know particularly in my case, you know, a lot of, it's been a little bit different for me in recent years, but blackout for myself at night, right? And having a whole other kind of uh, life and world and use going on and waking up and not being able to stay awake in school because I'm, my body's actually exhausted because I haven't been sleeping like other children. And I know there's a lot of other people out there like that. So it's almost like, you know, we, uh, like are working double time here, like we're who we are in our daytime life. And then there's something else at night. And the person in the daytime life doesn't get the privilege of knowing who they are at night until, you know, programming starts breaking down or something doesn't go exactly right. And then it becomes a catastrophe for them in their life because of all the, you know, oh, you're making that up. You're crazy. How can that possibly be? All this kind of stuff. And it's very, um, you know, I, I, I and just other people, and I, the only reason I speak about myself in the sense is because I'm the only person I really have direct knowledge of. It's not because I think in any way that my story is important or special or anything like that. I think there's way more people out there like us than anyone is aware of. Yes. But the amount of ridiculous stuff in my life, I, mean, I was having a conversation with my dad yesterday, and he's so, on, some, on one level, he has to get it, on another level, he totally doesn't get it, where I'm trying to explain to him how certain things in our life are evidence of this and he's trying to he uses that evidence that i'm wrong another thing that just further proves what i'm talking about right like he, like he, he like it's everything i mean there is no it almost feels like there is no part of my life that either hasn't been choreographed by some outside controlling entity or the other possibility is choreographed by myself in the future so that I can figure this out and wake up and remember, remember it and you know, whatever. I don't know which it is. I go back and forth between the two, you know, partly because um, I find it a lot easier to operate from, from the place of, I have a level of responsibility about this so I can do something about it. Not, not in the way that like, Oh, you know, I, what you were talking about earlier about people who are victims but want to think they're important and glamorized and that they're here to fight solar war. And I don't mean that. I just mean when, when, we get, when we get into this thing about all the stuff that they are doing to us, it sometimes leaves people in an unempowered position. And so I've found I'm able to make a lot more progress when I, you know, sort of wonder what my role in this is and, and what I can do. Um, what do you think about all that stuff? Yeah, I agree with all of that because – the biggest mystery is is not the mystery of the multiverse or or anything else. It's the mystery of who we are. And as yeah. you so brilliantly pointed out, what these beings do in this, and I'm one of those people, I really do believe this is a prison matrix. I really do believe that this is a soul harvesting, soul recyclement system, right? Uh, if it weren't, there would be no reason to wipe us of our uh, so many of our memories from past incarnations when we had to keep coming back here. Exactly. But for example, I've spoken to a number of my labs, people that I absolutely are convinced are having my lab experiences and have had ET experiences. And so many of them tell me, and I have no reason to doubt them. Yeah. I was a high priest in such and such life in ancient Egypt. I, I was a, I was a shaman in, 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 you know, the Amazon in, in one of my lives. So some of these people already had within their morphic resonance blueprint, this, latent metaphysical ability to do all these things right which makes them an ideal operational asset mm -hmm. because they can either be used for doing good things to you know for the greater good 
or they could be utilized or manipulated into doing things which they wouldn't agree with and don't want to do, right? Which often happens to my labs. So, for example, let's let's take you in this example. Okay, it looks like she's coming back again, right? You know, here comes trouble. So she's a real pain in the ass. <laughs> real pain in the ass. So what what they do is, and I, I'm not saying this happened in your case, but it happened in my case, and it happened in the, the cases of many others that I know. It seems that they try to limit our choices. Okay, so and so is coming back. Let's surround this person with so many narcissists, so many abusive people. Let's put them at key junctures throughout their life in so many crappy situations that, you know, before too long, they're going to be a drug addict, an alcoholic, a sex addict, all this stuff, right? And so it's our job to navigate through that. We just bump off resistance here, we go around, skirt around resistance there. We learn from it all. We don't feel victimized by it. Okay, learned everything I could from that nightmare scenario, and I've moved on, right? So it's, it's, there's an attrition rate at work, it seems to me. Like, there's so many people that have come in at this time, our age, age range, for example, age range, for example. And unfortunately, because of this attrition rate, a lot of them fell by the wayside. They came down with, you know, extreme mental uh, physical illness, for lack of a better term. Uh, they wound up in controlling restrictive marriages or partnerships. But again, these are people that not only are they having my lab project type experiences, but when you look in their past lives, oh, they were like a, you know, a commanding officer in the Roman legions back in a certain life. They were like a Greek admiral in another life. They were they were like a Native American medicine woman, and so they have all this in their background. But what the controllers do is, oh, you know, we're either going to neutralize that person so that they're a non-factor, or we're going to find a way to hijack yeah. them and plug them into all these different programs, you know, that which, which we ultimately and, control. Right. And, and the ideal is to do both, right. To, yeah. to be able to do both, both sides to, 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 to compromise them and to be able to utilize them. So that's absolutely. Like, and yeah. my, my most recent guest, Pat Jackson uh, talked about this brilliantly. When I interviewed her, she, she's had my lab experiences, she's had contacts with a number of different, some of them I consider to be uh, positive, uh, friendly ET races. And she said something I felt for a long time. That's, you know, the only way we could have infiltrated these deep black programs is by at some level volunteering to be a part of them. Because if right. we come in as say an engineer, as a scientist, as a military person, you're already right off the bat going to be operating under so much restraint, so many hindrances, they mind control those people too. They subject yeah. those people to trauma too. So one can only do so much if they're part of the program. Whereas if they're dragged kind of kicking and screaming from the outside, like a my lab or some other project person, well then that, they can work from the inside. And, and there is no higher security classification one can find for these deep black projects. Uh, the aforementioned Dr. Robert Sarbacher, he said in 1950, uh, to Dr. Wilbert Smith, who was a, a, a scientist for the Canadian uh, UFO program. He said that the UFO program was two points higher in secrecy and in priority than even the hydrogen bomb. He said this in 1950. So as far back as then, this program already had a super high priority, a super high classification. So how else does one infiltrate such an organization. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I personally feel that we are some, somewhere, our higher, highest selves are sitting outside of time and chose to sort of dive back into the pool at this angle to sort of penetrate kind of what you're talking about. You know what I mean? That we made that decision. We knew full well that, you know, we, we signed up for it coming in. And I think what happens is some, I, I think that where the memory wipe happens is the trauma of the birth process. I can't wait to sometime That's, ask Janine. Yeah. Asked, asked Denise Barcelo about that. So I think we come back in with these big plans of what we're going to do. Then we go through the tra trauma of the birth process. And then it takes us all this time, all of us sitting here are 40 or older, to start to piece together just the really, I mean, really small amounts of stuff that have gotten us to, to where we are with our knowledge of this now. And I think, you know, it's kind of like a race for, you know, are we going to are we going to figure it out fast enough kind of thing? Yes. But I think, yeah. uh, I'm sorry. So that, yeah, so I want to hear what you say. 
go ahead, Randy. And then I have one more thing I want to ask him after, but I want to hear what you okay. have to say about well, this. What's and interesting then I have one more about thing. this, um, James, you really referenced these extinction level events that have occurred as a result of external cat catastrophes and things like that, collisions with the earth. Um, we have geological history. We have some anecdotal and historical history. But you talk about the cosmic war, and whenever I see that, 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 that phrase, I'm reminded of the fact that what we may actually be in is a consciousness war, that in fact, we know we're at a point right now, we sense this, we have sensed this since we were born, most of us who are tuned in, that we are at a pivot point in the ages, the earth having different ages, not only just geological ages and cycles of whatever motions in space, but a fluidity of consciousness that's now hitting this high arc again. And it's not lost on me that when we go back and we look at these events, it looks like each time I am studying, like for instance, the so-called axial ages, which were the the rising period of the major five religions around the world occurred at a period of time after there was what you would have probably called a dark age, uh, a blackout. So we're in the consciousness war. We're on the cusp of this. And, and you know, it's not lost on me that I was told about this when I was a kid, when I was in contact with what I will call the benevolence, that I understood intuitively and explicitly that this was the period of time we were in, and we're in a race. We're in a race right now as a race of people to get to the threshold where we no longer are being dominated by outside forces. And the great war that has occurred sort of, World War II feels to me like that interregnum, that period of time when this battle really heated up. It feels like the great story that sets underneath World War II has to do with a lot of the things that you've talked about, that there was a race for technology, there was a race for ancient knowledge. Hitler wasn't going to Tibet looking for trinkets. He was looking for ascended masters. So in all of this, are we really not at this point in, in a battle for all of humanity? And in fact, maybe even a battle that consummates in this age? I know that was a long way to get to that question. Absolutely. That's why I've always regarded, you know, the real players in this field like yourselves as true spiritual warriors. And there is this ongoing pacification attempt to make us think that, oh, you know, if we just let things happen, everything's going to be fine. We're just going to send. And it doesn't work that way. It's, you know, we have to engineer a prison break, basically. And what myself and my colleagues have been saying is we're already in the fourth dimension. If you can look up and see a chemtrail being created right over your head, but the person next to you cannot see the same thing, right? And even when you point it out to them, which has happened to me, they act like I'm crazy when it's right there before their eyes, right? We're already going into the fourth dimension if there's so many people whose consciousnesses have been muted to the extent where they, they've completely lost or never had the survival instinct to begin with. And, and that's what's happening, quite frankly, folks, is, is that people have been so dumbed down, people, huh. consciousness of people have been so muted, and they've been indoctrinated in such false dogmas, patently disprovable. Yeah dogmas scientifically medically in every which way yes there, there is a separation and i say this with no sense of elitism that and you know we mix with the people that aren't quite at that level of awareness and understanding that we are and i wouldn't say that you know we tolerate them you know i wouldn't say we pat them on the head and you know like little children but you know sometimes we got to dumb our conversation down sometimes we just gotta you know if they say something outrageously stupid you know we either correct them or we just say you know i can't be bothered you know i just got too many things going on i don't want to get into a debate with someone who's just brainwashed and mind controlled so it's all about muting the consciousness and what i see is 
and this dovetails with the whole MyLab thing, it's not just that these MyLabs are being accessed by deep black elements of the military aerospace community in league with what I perceive to be, in many cases, negative beings, but these same MyLabs are interacting with, and in, indeed in some cases, were, are part of the extended family of higher dimensional, what I would consider benevolent, friendly ET races, right? Where we're basically boots on the ground, where they needed people, volunteers to come here, to come to this awareness at this point in time, because, I mean, call me spiritually unevolved, but if I can manifest even 40%, of all the metaphysical, metaphysical powers I've had throughout all my past incarnations, not only on Earth, but in other planes, other dimensions, other worlds, I'm just not going to do research. I'm going to go underground <laughs> <laughs> and, and wage cosmic multidimensional warfare. I'd be like an SAS operative, but in a cosmic multidimensional sense. I'd be hitting all the nodal, key nodal points, just creating a cascade of like, you know, just disharmony and chaos and disruption for, for all these negative forces. But that's just me, you know. And then someone doesn't have to have my mindset or my, you know, feeling of what I need to do here, right? But I know that, you know, call it spiritually unevolved. But considering what oh, they've no, done. I'm not going to call it that at all. I think what you just explicated there was probably yeah. the most advanced concept that we can get in our brain <laughs> yeah. right now. Emily, you had you had something. Yeah, so real, real quickly, so well, I have another question, but just when you were talking about muting the consciousness, I had kind of an interesting sort of syncretism kind of thought. You were talking about we as a race are in a race, or Randy, you said that as well. And isn't it interesting how when we as a race of people should be worried about this race to do a cosmic jailbreak, like you said, Instead, the way what they've done with all this muted consciousness is have them focusing on race, right? Look, yeah. look at how look at how distracting that is, and it's like they're focused, like 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 the, the whatever simulation or or whatever they have us stuck in. It's coded to express a race right now, or to express race, and the only thing they can do is confuse people as to which race that is. It, it's victim identity politics, and, and then they, right. they weren't even satisfied with that. They had to go into you know gender politics, gender identity politics. Everything is about atomization. Everything is about yeah. fragmentation. Everything is about creating these yeah. false it, divide lines, right? Because yeah, it was just, it was just a funny thought I had yeah. when, when you were talking about that. Wasn't the question, but yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, Sorry. Because you know the odds of 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 a Caucasian person having had only Caucasian incarnations is slim and none. I just don't yeah. see that happening, right? I mean, I were male and female. Uh, yeah, male right. or female. And people have said, yeah. oh, Bartley, you're a self-loather. You hate your own race <laughs> because they're all standing up for the white people, right? Well, it's you know, <laughs> when I see this white genocide at work, when it's just, you know, yeah. again, it's a third, fourth dimensional thing going on, right? Yep. And when I speak out about it, it's because I have the right to speak out about it. It's my sovereign right to say, this is happening and that's wrong, right? And so another thing, too, is a key point that you made, Emily, about the time, right? And how time isn't all it's cracked up to be. I've had countless precognitive dreams. Anyone who's had a precognitive dream will tell you straight up that time is not what it's all cracked up to be. Not only that, and you talked about how time is so fluid. I've had my lab experiences where I could have swore it happened to be last night. And then I talked to an individual who I, who was in the experience with me, who remembers virtually the same things that I remembered, but they say, no, it happened to me two months ago. I just never got around to telling you. You see, I just had that. I just had that with somebody the other day that I had, she, she had it a couple of nights before I had it. Yes. Yeah. So right off the bat, that tells you that they're able at some level to pluck us out of this time continuum, mm -hmm. time stream, utilize us, and then slip us back. But the frame of reference may not be the same for each participant or yep. each person drag kicking and, and screaming. And, and, and even what part, what part of the experience each person remembers may be slightly different, but there's some overlaps that prove that it was at the same place at the same time. Or this, yes. you know, at the, yeah. Okay, so here's the question. Maybe I'll ask the question now and we'll get the answer maybe on the other side. I've been waiting to sort of talk about this with someone and I wasn't expecting to bring it up with you today, but just the things they're talking about made me think this is the right time. So you talked about how 
like the my labs really increased in the 80s and 90s right like that, that there was some a little bit before that but that they really kicked up and increased then well i've had this theory that um you know how both in the 70s the draft was ended and supposedly mk ultra was made public and 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 saw and ended right declassified and ended well I have the theory, and remember when they had those sessions in Congress, they also took parts of those sessions in private where not everybody could hear them. I, have, I, I personally have this theory that the draft ended because now everybody's in the military. And so they, they were able to come forward and say, we ended MKUltra this, as this kind of you know, classified CIA kind of program. But what they didn't tell everybody is now everybody is in the military and you're going to serve in one way or another, whether you like it or not, whether it be as... Um, as just uh, test subjects in our spraying crap all over you program, or whether we can take you out of your bed physically or just energetically at night and do whatever we want with you. And um, yeah, I found it interesting that MK Ultra supposedly ended at the same time, around the same period of time that the draft ended. And then now from what you're saying, military abductions started to pick up after that point. So. Yes. And I think what happened was that, <laughs> The ETs that were working with the covert elements of the military aerospace community, they helped to identify who out there was having ET experiences, not only that these particular negative ETs were interacting with, but they were aware that other ET groups were interacting with the same person because one of the questions that these people would be asked when they're being drugged, debriefed, and tortured in some cases is, which ET groups are you interacting with? What do they look like? Where do they say they're from, et cetera? And, and getting to your question about the draft and all that, that's a brilliant, astute observation because Randy talked about how World War II was a watershed. So many black programs, the whole template of Manhattan Project, compartmentalization, secrecy, crash uh, programs kicked in a high gear. Also, with the mind control, it kicked in a high yeah. gear. I would argue that there is some overlap between, let's say, an MK Ultra minor, monarch and a MyLab. Uh, mm -hmm. Not often, but you will come across people that have had what I consider to be real MyLab experiences. They've had real ET experiences, but there's also this subtext of monarch SRA ritual abuse, right? And some of their experiences may be more the ones they remember, the ones that have more of a traumatic impact on them, maybe more SRA monarch related. So it's kind of an intuitive feel. I, I would say, okay, I feel this person is more a monarch, but they have my lab ET experiences too. Oh, this person has had monarch type experiences, some SRA experiences, but I would, if I had to categorize them, and I hate to put labels on people, but if I had to put a label on this particular person or categorize them, I'd say, yes, they've had some my lab experiences. They've also had monarch experiences. I, I know it's about as clear as mud, but, but you will come across people like that. You will come across people that have had the hardcore SRA stuff, but they've been used in time travel. They've been used in off-world stuff. And what I would remind people of, when you see all these Rihannas and Beyonce's and they're all giving the Illuminati symbols, that magic is black magic with a K at the end, for lack of a better term. That's something that's not native to this planet. I mean, there are practitioners of what we would call black magic on other worlds. And some of these ETs, they're teaching their hybrid uh, fraternal orders, hybrid priesthoods, how to do all this stuff. Because the consciousness of these uh, different civilizations, ET races, subterranean races, they've jumped right into these hybridized priesthood people with all the knowledge, all the know-how, all the black magic powers intact. So when you come across someone who's an adept, a warlock, a magus, that's in these programs, that's like a double whammy, right? So, so not only are they a mind controller, not only are they you know, a, a high-ranking military person or a corporate exec, but they're a black magician too. So when someone sees a Rihanna or a, or a Beyonce or someone like that, just remember that the consciousness is coursing through these people whether they've never set foot in a UFO, whether they've never seen a UFO, whether they even believe in UFOs or not, the consciousness with them then is, within them is hardly what I would consider to be human, okay? Because, you know, the, the ceremonies, the really grisly practices that they're compelled to take part in, and some of them gleefully take part in these kinds of very horrific ceremonies and rituals, 
the entities working through them uh, can hardly be called human. So I, I would remind people of that, that, okay, maybe someone's an MK Ultra or a monarch, and then they've never been part of these secret off-world MyLab type programs, but the consciousness working through them can hardly, in my estimation, be described as human. Yeah, no, very, very, very good points. I think the, uh, from just talking to a lot of people and, and doing a lot of research and then, you know, my, feeling into my own experiences and listening to Randy talk about his and whatever, I think that, like, whatever program you're going to be used for, if it's more of a monarch kind of program or, or a military abduction or some kind of whatever, whatever, off-world kind, off, whatever it is, I think that the point of some of the SRA sexual abuse stuff is they found it being the, one of the most handy things for compartmentalization so that they can, you know, very easily, uh, you know, give people amnesia, mind wipe, compartmentalize, you know, create alters, triggers, whatever. So I think that obviously, like, in a pro when someone is, like, clearly a monarch, there's more of that stuff. There's more focus on those sort of SRA and sexual aspects of it. But I think pretty much everybody who's going to be used in some, you know, one of these kinds of ways gets, a t gets some taste of it yes. because of how, how, because of how uh, effective it is in two things, in, in opening up a certain geometry in that person's brain through the spinal, like through what happens to the, with the, you know, with the spine and spinal fluid and, and the root chakra system, because a lot of the pro, a lot of the, from my, under, from my understanding that the, the programming, the, comp the compartmentalization on a certain level is, we think of it as being in the brain, but that a lot of these programs are laid down in the chakra points using sort of sacred geometry kinds of uh, sigils and maps and things like that. Right. And the, sexual abuse or the SRA kind of stuff is particularly effective for that. Now, I think it, as we move forward with technology, we may see less of that because there's technological ways of doing it. You know what I mean? Like, and, and because, you know, and because the awareness around, you know, sexual abuse, even though it's still rampant now, you know, like I think that part of the reason they're allowing the information about it to come out now is because they've figured out technical, technological ways to accomplish the same task of basically um, t taking up camp in a person's chakra system and, and, you know, in their sort of spinal fluid and in their brain and also new ways of compartmentalizing. I agree. The, okay. I'll just make this point on, on, the, on the other side. Yeah. No, no, go ahead. Finish up, James. Okay. Yeah, and, and just to elaborate on that point, uh, I agree that uh, they found other means to accomplish the same ends and from a mind control, energy manipulation standpoint. I believe also that the whole rape aspect to it, there's, it's always going to be there only because uh, there's just going to be these entity-infested reptilian mm -hmm. hybrid males who just want to rape and abuse women. I mean, think of your standard yeah. psychopath, yeah. Uh, serial murder, yeah. et cetera. And that's, that, actually and also, gonna, that's actually going to segue nicely over into the yeah. second hour as well. So, yeah. um, well, that first segment blew by really fast. We missed the clock, but that's okay. You folks out there got... got There's no clock. time. There is no <laughs> time, but we're compressing time. So if you play this at double speed, <laughs> It'll be as fast. Anyway, <laughs> that's going to wrap it up. James Bartley. Oh, Brandy, we lost you. You muted yourself. Tell people. <sighs> James, well, let, me, let people know where they can find you. Okay. You can go to my website, thecosmicswitchboard.com, and you can see the, uh, the interviews that I've done, the commentaries that I've done. Uh, I've had a lot of great guests, yourselves included, uh, we've only been doing this for about the last two years plus. Also, you can find my dedicated YouTube channel, James Bartley. So uh, I encourage uh, your listeners to check it out. There's a lot of, a lot of stuff in there, a lot of different uh, diverse subjects. Excellent. Awesome. And uh, that's going to wrap it up for this segment. If you'd like to hear and see more, go over to patreon.com forward slash off planet media. And that's our patron site for subscribers. Uh, $3 level will get you all of the extra segments and some extra bonuses as well. Main website is offplanetradio.com. I'm Randy Moggins. The truth is out there. It's inside you. And thanks to James Bartley for joining us for this segment. Thanks for having me. Oh, no.